So today we're going to learn about sea star wasting syndrome. And first, what is sea star wasting syndrome? Well, sea star wasting syndrome is something that's been killing sea stars. Uh, there are events going back farther in the past, but the most recent die-off event happened along the west coast of North America in 2013, 2014, 2015, and then in 2016, it reached as far north as Kachemak Bay, and we saw a die-off of sea stars here. When we say sea star wasting syndrome, we're talking about a group of signs and symptoms that we can observe in sea stars. So the first sign of sea star wasting syndrome is the presence of a white lesion or more than one lesion. And these lesions or kind of injuries on the sea stars are areas that typically might look a little bit gooey. It might look like a little bit of tissue has been lost. So instead of being a bump or an area that is clearly inflamed and raised, it's actually an area where there seems to be some tissue missing and it's usually kind of white and a little bit soft as well. The second sign that we are oftentimes looking for is either the degeneration, sort of the falling apart of tissue at the ends of the rays, or the loss of a, an entire ray, also called an arm or a leg, from that sea star. And then over time, if the sea star wasting syndrome gets worse, the sea star will develop more and more lesions, more and more degeneration of tissue, and more of those rays will fall off. And eventually, in severe cases, the sea star usually dies um, as its tissue falls apart. And what we end up finding in the end in these situations are sort of rays that have fallen apart and are just scattered on the beach or these sort of gooey piles of rotting tissue. It's pretty gross looking when you find a sea star with severe sea star wasting syndrome. Now you might be wondering what causes sea star wasting syndrome? That is a really excellent question and one that there actually aren't many clear answers to yet. This is a question that lots of researchers are working on trying to figure out. In the past, sea star wasting syndrome events were caused by bacteria and or linked to warmer water temperatures. This event, which like I said, started in 2013 and continues in some places until today, doesn't have as clear of a cause. It might be caused by bacteria, it might be caused by a virus or more than one virus, or it might be caused by environmental factors like water temperature, changes in salinity, changes in oxygen content of the water, toxins from harmful algal blooms, pollution, changes in ocean pH. There's lots of different theories out there. And the more research is done on this, the more likely it seems that the cause of sea star wasting syndrome is actually more than one thing. So more than one of these factors that are coming together and interacting with each other. And that's what caused the bigger die-offs that were seen a few years ago. Why is sea star wasting syndrome important to know about? Well, sea stars are a really important part of the ecosystem here in Kachemak Bay and beyond. They're considered keystone predators, which means that they have a really big influence or effect on the rest of the ecosystem. And this is understood for true stars, which is a really common species of sea star here, and also their relatives, the ochre stars. True stars and ochre stars feed on lots of bivalves like clams and mussels, and their role in eating mussels is especially important. So when there are true stars around, they kind of limit how far down into the intertidal zone, how low on the beach blue mussels can get, because those sea stars will crawl up at the high tides and eat any mussels that come down into the mid or low intertidal zone. But if there aren't many sea stars around, the mussel band can extend farther and farther down towards the deeper parts of the intertidal zone. And this can have pretty significant impacts on the other types of animals that can live there because a mussel bed is good habitat for some types of organisms, especially those that like muddy sediments, like worms, but not so good habitat for other types of organisms that need clear rock to attach to, like barnacles and anemones and lots of types of algae. So without many sea stars around, it can change 
how big that muscle bed is, which can in turn change what types of animals can live in the intertidal zone. Similarly, sunflower stars are really important predators because they feed on sea urchins. And sea urchins, in turn, love to eat kelp and algae, and especially the bottom part of the algae called the holdfast, where that algae is attaching to the rock. So if a sea urchin comes along and chews through the holdfast and the stipe of the algae, the rest of that organism, that algae, just sort of floats away. And so even eating just an inch or two of the algae, the urchin can dramatically change the ecosystem. And in many places it's been recorded where there are fewer sunflower stars, you can get a boom in the sea urchin population. And then that can change how much kelp and other algae is around. It can actually, in some places, have a really significant effect on kelp forests. Without as many sunflower stars, you can end up with a lot less kelp forest habitat because it's all getting grazed down by sea urchins. So that's something that people are really curious about in Kachemak Bay, what the impact of fewer sunflower stars might be here. So now that you understand that sea star wasting syndrome can have such a big impact on our local ecosystems, you might be wondering if the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies is doing anything to track or understand sea star wasting syndrome here. And we are. Since 2014, we've been collecting data on sea stars in three permanent plot locations around our Peterson Bay field station. We're really fortunate that because sea star wasting syndrome happened farther south first, we were able to begin collecting these data before the big die-off event happened. So we've been able to track the change over time. So with those surveys, we go out every spring, summer, fall, and winter, and we count, measure, and look for signs of wasting in all the tree stars and ochre stars within the permanent plot area. And we also do a subtitle count walking along the water's edge, looking for sunflower stars, leather stars, and other less common stars. This has been a really cool project to be part of. We've learned a ton by participating in the Sea Star Monitoring Network, and we really appreciate all the students and community volunteers that have helped us collect these data over time. We are looking to include more people in this project, so if you're at all interested, definitely get in touch with us, and maybe we'll see you out there sometime soon on one of the beaches.